baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Praise the Lord, everybody. One more time, let's just love him. Thank you, Jesus, for being our gracious God and Savior. We stand in awe of you, God. We love you, Jesus, with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. We commit this service to you, God. We commit this service to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, I have officially started preaching as of this moment. And I'm really just going to be... Uh, I'm going to go to the Word of the Lord and bring you a uh, study that I have uh, done. And, uh, I hope it's a, a blessing and a help. At least I know it'll give us something to think about. But um, I'm just I'm going to be talking to you from my heart. And uh, we are in the last days, and we are in very, very interesting days. The following comments I'm about to make, I have not made to the church in Rialto, but I will. I've just recently uh, went through twice a uh, book on the history of the Azusa Street Revival. I've been giving tours about Azusa Street for well over 20 years now, and um, but a couple of things stood out to me, and I think what clicked it in my mind is because we know that we are in momentous times. I've made mention of that uh, every service thus far. As far as our nation is concerned, there's a lot of trauma, a lot of turmoil. But something stood out to me. One testimony, there was a pastor of a Baptist church there in Los Angeles. And um, his mother had been going to the Bonnie Bray prayer meetings. And so she, she talked to him and to the church. She stood up one night and talked. So he and his church board was going to Bonnie Bray Street. They'd been having some powerful prayer meetings and people were gathering outside at night. And... Um, as he was gathering, coming into this crowd, he noticed that the vast majority of the folks were, were black people praying. And, and he, as he was walking in, he literally, this is his testimony, as he was coming into it, he said to himself, oh my, what kind of a mess am I getting myself into? And he said, God instantly smote him and said, if you don't humble yourself, you will receive nothing. And he said he got into it, humbling himself. He was also the man that helped procure the Azusa Street uh, building and paid to get it cleaned up as much as they could to get it ready and receive the Holy Ghost and went on, went on. Another testimony that I got from there was... Um, from Charles Mason. Now, Charles Mason lived in Memphis, Tennessee. And in the 1890s, he and another man named Jones formed the Church of God in Christ, which is, as you know, it's a, today it's a large Pentecostal black organization. And it was the first, became the first Pentecostal organization in America. But he had formed it in the 1890s and then he was of a strong holiness background. And when he began to hear about Azusa Street, he decided he was going to go. So he went in 1907. 
So he got there, and, and, uh, but he was not receiving the Holy Ghost. He determined they were telling the truth, but he was not going to leave till he got it. And he said he was there for a few weeks, two weeks at least, and not receiving the Holy Ghost, praying hard. And, uh, and God dealt with him. Now, this is 1907, and most of the Church of God in Christ churches were in the deep south here, south. And in those days, the Jim Crow laws were very strong in effect across the nation and adhered to. And in those days, they were from 1900 to 1910, they're averaged, this is history, 65 lynchings every year taking place. And he, he didn't use the word bitter, but he was, uh, he was carrying a lot of baggage of resentment. So here was a white man coming into this, this um, black meeting at the time, and God dealt with him and said, if you don't humble yourself, you won't get anything from me. Here was a black man that by that time, the Azusa Street Revival was going, and there was whites and blacks everywhere, and worshiping together, and praying together, and crying, and 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 he was struggling with the white people being there, and he, and he because he he thought of injustice, and and one night he said God dealt with him. I'm giving these were the essence of his words, and said, "You think I'm not aware of injustice?" You think I'm not aware of traumas and problems and trials? Amen. You need to give that stuff to me and basically do my work. And he said he wept and cried and surrendered. And as soon as he did, he started speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gave him the utterance. Amen. And he went back through all of his churches and preached the Holy Ghost message and they accepted it. And before he died, G.T. Haywood baptized him in Jesus' name. They couldn't prove that for a hundred years, but a friend of mine found the letter, presented it to the University of Birmingham, England, proving that he was baptized in Jesus' name by G.T. Haywood. So, uh, I thought of that and I thought, God, this is why I keep repeating and I'm going to give this speech to our church because these are tremulous, tremulous times. We cannot allow anything to divert us from what God has called us to do. First and foremost, our citizenship is from above. Our citizenship is from above. Amen. And... Um, so I also think it's good, and that's where I'm, I'm coming into the word of the Lord here, that we recognize how close we are to his coming. I think it's essential that we keep in mind we're not long for this world. I have no idea how long we are, but we are in the end of the end time. We know this from several things. One of them is in uh, Ezekiel 37. The prophet is carried away and he sees a valley of dry, scattered bones. They're not just bones, they're dried bones. And God asks him a question. And they're human bones. Over here is a skull. and There's a femur bone and there's hips. and They're everywhere. And God said to him, Son of man, can these bones live? And apparently he, he had, uh, you know, when a pastor's in, been in a lot of counseling sessions, he learned some things. He said, oh God, thou knowest. And, uh, and so God said, well, you prophesy. Prophesy to these bones. And as he opened his mouth and he began to prophesy, the spirit began to move and there came a great shaking. You can imagine the clattering in this great valley. This is a vast 
valley. No doubt as far as the eyes could see of bones. And he hears this shaking and clattering. And before his eyes, as he is prophesying under the power of the Lord, he is seeing bone come to bone. And, and now these skeletal structures are standing on their feet. What a sight that must have been. And, and yet, yet this unction is on him. And what, then he sees sinews begin to grow up around those bones and then here comes flesh and then here comes skin and they're standing there but they're still lifeless they're there but they're lifeless and then he says keep prophesying and as he did he said blow thou north wind come thou south and the east and the north from all parts of the heaven and the, and the spirit blows and life comes into them God said, I will open the graves of these people that are scattered throughout the nations and I'm going to bring them back. And he said, what an amazing thing, when he describes Israel coming back into being, his first and foremost description was great army. Army. Not great worshipers not great Talmudic scholars, an army. Israel, the nation, is known for two things today. First, they're Jewish. Second, they're bad to the bone. No pun intended. Amen. They have an army. Some state that it is the fourth most powerful army on earth. I rather doubt that. However, it is something to consider that these are exceptional people and what God has done is very, very amazing. And uh, when it comes to their militaristic endeavors and achievements, they've been fascinating. We talked about the War of Independence, the 5,000 to one army people warred against them and yet they defeated, they came across, they won. The 56th campaign was bloody and brutal, but they overcame. The 67 war, the 73 war, etc. But uh, in 2016, just to give you a glimpse of their, their savvy, their intelligence, where they're headed and where they're ready to go, the nation of Israel submitted over 8,000 patents on the world stage. They patented 8,000 scientific technological inventions. The vast majority of those patents were military. Almost 8,000 military patents in the year 2016. To get the picture of this, when you take all of the Muslim-led nations of the world. This is where it's a Muslim government. So work your way around the Middle East. Work your way into the far reaches of Asia. There are countries there that are Muslim ruled. Go to Pakistan, etc., etc. All of the Muslim ruled nations on earth came up with 500 patents of any kind all together. Israel had 8,000. The nation of Iran in 2016 had 50. So don't think these boys aren't staying up at night planning and working. And they know this. This is one of the reasons that uh, President Trump's very unheralded achievement as far as these peace treaties are concerned uh, is an amazing thing. I think part of that is economic factors. Part of it was Trump's personality and, and the American power. And the other part of it is they know you really, really don't want to mess with Israel if you can help it. Now, I think as interesting as the nations that signed peace treaties so far is nations that have not signed peace treaties so far. That have not. And um, so there's two things to consider there. One, when people say, peace, peace, then shall sudden destruction come upon them. 
And the other is, there are nations around Israel that there's only one thing, one thing only that will ever convince them, at least for a time, that they better not mess with Israel. So in 37, these bones come together. They're out of every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. We talked about the role Adolf Hitler played. And then here, now, they had their... Their uh, 75th anniversary, 70th anniversary, excuse me, two years ago, 70th anniversary as a nation. And, uh, and they are mighty indeed militarily, scientifically. Then you get to chapter 38. 37, they're a nation of army. In 38, and if you, Mr. Uh, sound man can go to verse 1 and just kind of keep your finger there on the button. We're going to ooze around a little bit. But in verse 1 of chapter 38, they become an army in 37. Now the word of the Lord came unto me, Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth in all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Notice these nations, they have not signed any treaties. Persia, which is today Iran. Ethiopia, which is in the process of building more mosques in Ethiopia, quicker than any other nation on earth right now. And Libya, with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Then it speaks of Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togorma, and of the north quarters, everybody say north. north, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Now, just exactly who all these nations are, we don't know. When it comes to Gog and Magog, the, um, uh, a lot of scholarships identify Magog as being associated with the ancient peoples known as the Scythians which on the day of Pentecost, there were people speaking in the Scythian tongue. And uh, the ancient historian Joseph Flavius, or Josephus, identifies Magog. Magog founded the Magogians. This is Josephus, thus named after him, but who were by the Greeks called the Scythians. So the Scythian name covers a number, they say, of nomadic tribes, uh, from the Russian steppes to the Fertile Sea of the Ukraine north up to the Black Sea. They believe that's the area where the Scythians lived. Ancient names, modern explanations of, of Rosh. Some consider that Russia. The uh, chief ancient Sarmatians were known as Rashu, Rasapu, Ros, Ras, or translated in the adjective chief, I don't want to bore you here, but Magog is thought to be perhaps Central Asia, again, the ancient Scythians, and today, Islamic Southern Republics of the former Soviet Union, with a population of 60 million Muslims. This ancient territory could include modern Afghanistan. When you read of Meshach, this is believed with Tubal also to be Turkey, uh, ancient Muscai, Moscow, Cilicia, Cappadocia, Tubal is also Turkey, just south of Russia and Iran. Of course, Persia is Iran. It was changed from Persia to Iran in 1935. And uh, then in 1953, the CIA and the British MI5 uh, installed the Shah, his father. That's not hearsay. That's exactly what happened. And then, of course, Ethiopia is Ethiopia. It's south of Egypt. Put 
possibly uh, west of Libya. And then again, Gomer, portions of, of uh, Turkey, ancient Cimmerarians, and on and on and on. Beth Togomora, again, portions of Turkey, etc. And many peoples with you. Who are these other peoples? Uh, very possibly, probably uh, Islamic nations. Again, could be Iraq, could be Syria, could be Jordan, could be Egypt. Again, none of which have signed any peace treaties with Israel. So in verse 7, please notice this. He says, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself. This is Gog, Magog, and Associates. And all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now this is believed, and I, I don't know. Listen, when it comes to prophecy, I look through a glass darkly. And prophecy is best explained by its unfolding. Okay? I'm not an expert. Don't pretend to be an expert. By way just of letting you know as to, um, as to my rapture theories, I am, I am a self-acclaimed pan-tribulation theorist. And that is, you know, there's pre, mid, and post. Pan means come trouble or woe, sorrow or no, it's going to pan out. Praise God. Just live for Jesus and walk with him in truth. If, to my mind, if you take these portions of Ezekiel, many portions of Isaiah, the book of Zechariah, the book of Daniel, Matthew 24, 5, Luke 21, Mark 13, um, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, get into the book of Revelation and the smatterings of others, and you put them all in a big pot, and you boil them and stir them, and you had to boil it down to the essence of two words. I believe all of eschatology, when you boil it down to two words, if you had to, it's called be ready. Be ready. Hallelujah. We don't want to be like the guy that, now when I vote for pre. If God's taking votes, I vote for pre. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, hallelujah. But I heard the guy that, uh, he was a strong post guy, and he determined, so he, he built, this is true, he built a, an underground shelter. I mean, he, he said you could drop a bomb on it, and he'd be all right. He got that thing solid. He, got, he had so much, so much dried food and canned goods and, 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 and guns and bullets, and, and he, was, he, was set, he, was set, he was set for anything the Antichrist could throw at him. And he died of a heart attack. <laughs> Amen. When it says no man knows the day or the hour, there ain't none of us knows the day or the hour. Hallelujah. You could die while I'm preaching tonight. I just hope I don't preach that long. Praise God. So I'm, we, here we are, though. We look through, I look through a glass darkly. And so in verse 9, it says, Thou shalt ascend. In fact, no, let's go back to verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. So they're coming to the land from which the Jewish refugees have been gathered back from the diaspora, at least enough to make a mighty nation. And it says, and they're gathered out of many people. Notice this, this is important, against the mountains of Israel. Now everybody say mountains. Okay, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations. They shall dwell surely of all them. Verse 9, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, and thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. But please notice this. It does not say all nations. It does not say all nations. It gives the names of nations. Some of them we know, some of them we don't. There's some with them. And they're coming from the north and they're going to the mountains. 
But it doesn't say from every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. It doesn't say from all nations. Verse 10, thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at that time, that same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them without walls, having neither bars nor gates. The towns, cities sprinkled around Israel, especially the northern area where the mountainous area is, they are unprotected by way of any walls or anything like that. It says they come, verse 12, to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Amen. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord in that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. When you get to Revelation, it talks about a 200 million man army that comes from the east and compasses itself around Jerusalem. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem compassed about, this is not compassing Jerusalem. This is in the mountains, amen, of the north area, coming from the north. They will cover as a, uh, and I will bring thee against the land. This is verse 17. And then it says in, in verse, I'm sorry, verse 16. And the last part of that says that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So the heathen peoples of the earth, apparently, are going to realize, whoa, God has helped Israel. Verse 18, And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord, that my, my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places fall, every wall shall fall to the ground. Now that definitely sounds like the Battle of Armageddon. But it keeps going back to this, and I think this is important. When God gives prophecies, how many times does he throw in future precepts? Just keep that in mind. Verse 21, for I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. This is not in Megiddo. This is not the Valley of Jezreel. This battle six times says mountains, 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 mountains. It does not say Jezreel or Megiddo. I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many peoples that are with him and overflowing. Verse 23, thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations. They shall know that I am the Lord. Now, I'm going to just stop here and make this statement. Here's my proposal. But I, I let, let me tell you something. Number one, this is not a heaven and hell issue. Number two, I look through a glass darkly. This is what it seems to me. But God is big and he can do anything he wants. And, but I lean, I lean... I lean that I'm leaning, and this has been recent over the last few years, that the battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not the battle of Armageddon. And, I'm gonna, and it's important, I think, to know why. And, uh, 
but it's a precursor. And there's an important reason for this battle prophetically. Now, verse 1 of chapter 39. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and leave but a sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon, looky there, the mountains of Israel. This is not Jezreel. This is not the valley of Armageddon. Thou shalt fall, verse 4, thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel. Thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, to the beast of the field to be devoured, rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Now, is this the hailstones that he speaks of in the book of Job? Is this the hailstones that he speaks of in the book of Revelation? It may be. And it could also just be another time of hailstones not mingled with fire. And fire and brimstone... Uh, this could be fire and brimstone poured out. It could also be they're blowing each other to pieces. I don't know. Notice verse 6. I will send fire upon Magog and upon them that dwell carelessly in the isles. They shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is come, it is done, saith the Lord. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields, the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, hand staves, the weaponry, spears. They shall burn them with fire seven years. It shall come to pass, verse 11, in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel and the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea and it shall stop the noses of the passengers and there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog and seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord. Now I'm going to stop here and make a statement. In the 67 war, it was a miraculous thing what Israel pulled off. And um, I became friends with, a, with an old Jewish man when I first moved to Rialto. He was a Messianic Jew. They called him the rabbi. He... He, he, had, he always wore a hammocker, and uh, I don't think his wife was Messianic, but he, he believed that Jesus was. He really liked me. He, wanted, he said, I could teach you Hebrew. I could have you speak in Hebrew in six months. And, uh, but I didn't take him up on it. He came to our church, I think, two or three times, and he loved it. He loved our church. He loved the worship. He loved the presence, but his wife didn't like it, so... She was like 30 years younger than him, and she took him home. But uh, I was visiting with him one day, and he was talking about his times. And I said, wait, 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 wait. You were there for what years? And he told me. I said, so you were in Israel in the 67 war? He said, oh, yes, yes, yes. I'd been, I think he'd been there at that time. He said, I'd been there 15 years at that time. And uh, I said, okay. So I heard this story. I came to God in 1972. The Six-Day War was five years old, and there was still a lot of talk out about what Israel had wrought in the Six-Day War. I said, one of the stories I heard was Israeli pilots that would land when their battles were over, and they'd get out, they would say, there were angels up there, and they were fighting for us. I said, but I've also heard that Jordanian pilots, those that didn't get blown out of the skies, and by the way, when they were, they took on Egypt, destroyed their air force almost completely on the ground, 80% of it, and, and, and 
the Egyptians, rather than admit they'd been caught blindsided, they, all they could talk about on the radio was, we're winning victories, we're doing this and doing that. So, so they're lying through their teeth, but the Syrians are listening to the radio and all of their lives, and they're thinking, man, they're going to clean house, and we're not going to get a piece of the action. And so they jumped into the war, and Israel started whooping them up one side and down the other, but they couldn't say that they were losing since how Egypt was winning, so they were talking about their great victories. And Israel would not, they wouldn't say, no, they're not, they're lying, because they knew, they knew. Once it gets out that Israel is winning this war, the United Nations will step in and stop it in a heartbeat. As long as it looks like Israel's getting beat, they'll keep their mouths shut. And that's exactly what happened. And so Jordan, who was the most decent nation towards them, he was thinking, man, Egypt's going to get the spoils. Syria's going to get the spoils. And they kept sending messages to King Hussein, stay out. Don't do it. Just trust us, please. But it was too much of a temptation. So he sends in his air force and and they all get thumped. And so they took back the Golan Heights. And once the United Nations realized what was happening, they put a stop on it. That's why it was a six-day war. But uh, one book said a German, I mean, an uh, Israeli general was stating, he said it was so uncanny. He said every mistake we made worked out for our good. And everything they tried worked out for their bad. And that'd be one thing. But so I asked, uh, and, but it was told that Jordanian pilots that didn't get blown away and they could actually land, as well as Syrian pilots and a few Egyptian pilots that they could actually land, they also would say, there were beings up there and they were fighting, but they weren't on our side. So I asked my Jewish friend, you were there. Did you hear stories like that? He said, absolutely. He said, Israel is a huge family. And every family in Israel had somebody that was either in the Air Force, in the Army, or in the tank commands, and even somewhat at sea in there at that time, minuscule Navy operations. And, uh, and said everybody had stories like that. Brother Marler has a book. He said, he said I'm going to get this to you. And it was written by, after he was out of the country, way wouldn't get killed for it, he had been an Egyptian general. And he said, it's time to tell the truth about the Six-Day War. He said, there'd be times our tank brigades we were ready, and all of a sudden, we would hear what sounded like thousands of tanks coming up over the rise. He said the noise was deafening, and we thought, oh, have mercy. The Americans, here they are. And so they would flee, and there was never any tanks. And fighter jet pilots for their side would say they were closing in, and all of a sudden, they'd hear the roar of jets that sounded like, 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 like the Mediterranean was sweeping in on them, and they'd dodge and they would see no planes. So it was coming from both sides. This, my friend of mine, he said, absolutely. He said, every family had stories like that. They would come home, and their boys would sit there and say. We... But the world said the only reason they won was because of the United States intervention. That was their answer. And I'm just going to tell you, Lyndon Johnson was... They were, the United States was mired in the Vietnam War. They didn't want to have to fool with something else. And, and Johnson did not prove a real stalwart guy. And they sent the USS Pueblo, and it was in the Mediterranean, and the Israelis bombed it. I mean, they blew that thing almost out of the water and killed over 100 American sailors. But they said, sorry, it was spying for the Syrians. And, and they said, that's an American deal. And they said, okay, we're sorry. And they gave American people money that they lost their kids. It's a deal. But finally, Johnson did pour out and helped them. But by then, it was only six days long. So, but they said, no, no, no. 
it was the U.S. that bailed them out. And then in 73 war, they were not doing well. They would have pulled it off, but Richard Nixon did at the last minute send in so much, so much materials that it, even the Jews were shocked at how much the United States was sending them. And they pulled up. They were just about to take Cairo. They were going to c control Cairo. And Kissinger said, stop, no more. And then when it was over, you can read it for yourself, the history of it. They stole the victory. Israel won it, but it, the peace treaty was a horrid deal. Golda Meir had to resign uh, from being prime minister and on and on and on. But it was, a, it was, but again, they said it was the U.S. that pulled the chestnuts out of the fire. In this war, they're in it by themselves. Nobody helps them but God. You read this. Their only ally is God. And when that war is over, all the nations, they won't be able to say, well, the U.S. saved them because the U.S. wasn't involved. All the nations will know the only way they pulled that one off was God. And the Jews that were good after the 67 war beating their chest will say, it was only God. It was only God. Now, question where is the U.S.? We are their greatest ally right now. President Trump was the only president ever to go to the Wailing Wall. He was the only one to put the embassy in Jerusalem. Amen. And he's the one that verified, no, the Golan Heights is theirs. They don't give it up. So, where is America in this war? God knows. God knows. It could be rioting, and we could be having revival. You hear me? God knows. We don't know where America's at in this. But our job is to get Americans saved. That's our job, is to build the kingdom that the increase of that kingdom shall know no end. So it says, uh, verse 17, So the Son of Man, thus saith the Lord, speak to every feathered fowl, to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves, come together, come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice. You may do sacrifice, even the great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. Again, not valleys, mountains. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, rams and lambs and goats and bullocks, all the fatlings of Bashan. You shall eat to the full, etc. Verse 21, and I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, my hand have I laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me. Therefore I hid my face from them and gave them to the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword according to their uncleanness. Verse 26, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses. Verse 27, and when I brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused... Uh, them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I've gathered them into their own land and left none of them there anymore. Now, uh, notice this. We're going to go to the book of Zechariah, dear brother, chapter 14. We're going, we'll come back to Ezekiel. But in Zechariah 14 and 2, for I will gather all nations, everybody say all, all nations to battle. And the city, this is Jerusalem, shall be taken. And the house is rifled and the women ravished. And half the city shall go into captivity and the residue of the people shall not 
be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. In this battle, notice, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof and toward the east and toward the west. So this does not sound like the battle in the mountains. This is a battle where the focal point, amen, happens, ends up in Jerusalem when he comes. But we also know that the blood is so deep it'd be to the horse's bridles in Megiddo. Now, I want to point out some things here. In chapter 39, where the battle takes place, is the driving force in the battle of Gog and Magog is it God? God said, I put a hook in your jaws and will bring you. In Armageddon, there is another force that drives the battle of Armageddon. It's the Antichrist and his forces. Amen. In Revelation, in the Gog, in Revelation, it's the Antichrist that is pushing the Armageddon war. In the chapters 38, 39 of Ezekiel, is deception involved? Not really. They want to go to, to the land of unwalled villages so they can get their goodies. Think about Ethiopia. Think about if it's Iraq. Think about Persia. Think about the common people and all of the goodies. If you've been through Israel, it's what they have done is mind-boggling. And, and here's, here's peasants. They're in garbs and they're ready to fight and they're in the army now, and they think about all the cattle they got and all the cities that are so fine, and we can go down and loot and plunder. That would sound pretty good. In the Battle of Armageddon, loot and plunder is not what they're after. It's total, total, total destruction. In, in chapter 38 and 39, it says that the cities of Israel are dwelling safely and secure. In Armageddon, there ain't no city safe and feeling safe. They, they know it's not good. So again, in the battle, in 38 and 39, it's in the mountains. In the book of Revelations, the battle is in, the main battle is in the valley of Jezreel. And the scope of the participants in chapter 38 and 39 is limited. But the scope of the participants in Revelation is global. In 38 and 39, is there any mention of God appearing? No. In the book of Revelation, he stands on the Mount of Olives and it splits in two. Now, I'm going to just throw this your way very quickly. I don't want to get bogged down more than I already am. I have preached out of 1 Kings chapter 20. We won't go there. But I have preached out of that for many years. There is a message that my text is I read every word of the entire chapter. That's my text. And in, Revel in, in 1 Kings 20, Jezebel is queen, Ahab is king. Here comes Ben-Hadad from Syria, and there are 32 kings with him. Ben-Hadad tells Ahab, hey, your gold is mine, your silver is mine, your wives are mine, your kids are mine. And Ahab says, amen, even so, yes. So, Ben-Hadad with his 32 kings, he says, I'm sending messengers tomorrow, and they're going to walk through your palace, and anything they see they like, they're taking and bringing it to me. And Ben-Hadad and Ahab, he calls the elders and said, that's what he says he's going to do. They said, you can't let him do that. So he says, Ben-Hadad, uh, I agree to the first part, but I don't agree to the second. They can't come do that. He said, your entire army don't amount to a bit of dust compared to what I've got to come against you. And Ahab says, well, don't let him that puts on the harness brag as he that's already done his work, day's work and taking it off. So a prophet comes to Ahab. He said, set the battle in array. And there's going to be a war and you're going to win. Who's going to order the battle? You are. Really? He sets them out there. And Ben-Hadad's in his pavilion with his kings and he's drinking. 
And somebody comes in and says, hey, the Israeli army's out there. And, and they, Ben Hadad says, ah, if they want to fight, just take them captive. If they come to surrender, just take them captive. And he keeps on drinking. So they go out there and those armies thump Ben Hadad. They thump them bad. Next thing you know, people are running through the camps screaming. Ben Hadad has to f- jump on a horse and flee for his life. And Israel is mind bogglingly victorious. Now, uh, a prophet comes to Ahab and said, You better mind what you're doing because, listen up, they're coming back. They're coming back. So Ben Hadad, he's out licking his wounds. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I remember two or three years later or whatever. And, they, and his men said, listen, their God is the God of the hills. He's not the God of the valley. Our problem was we fought in the hills, in the mountains. If we fight in the valley, we'll win this thing. So this time they come into the valley and Israel pulls it off again. Why do you suppose that's in the Bible? Why would God do a great victory like that for the likes of Ahab and Jezebel? Never was there a king that so gave himself to do evil as was Ahab and his wife, which did stir him up. But God, that he would show Israel, the backslid nation, I am your God, and show the heathens, I'm their God in the mountains, and I'm their God in the valley of Jezreel. Okay? Well, let me tell you something. The leadership of Israel is not Ahab and Jezebel. But don't think they're God-fearing. I'm not being ugly. I mean, just really. And I like Netanyahu as much as I know him. But you understand, we're not talking about a really, really God-fearing nation. Do you know how many atheists there are in Israel? How many Jews are atheists? And you know why a lot of those Jews are atheists? Listen to me. They say, if there was a God, where was he when the Holocaust took place? If he's the God of the Jews, where was he when the gas chambers were pouring out? And so there's a lot of atheism. And then there's, then there's the Orthodox. And then there's... and. And so, why are those things? Why was that there in 1 Kings 20? The Bible says, All these things happened to them for examples. They're written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world have come. Israel is in interesting times right now. As of April 2020, Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky, he is one of the top three rabbis in Israel today. One of the top three important rabbis in Israel today, and he don't mind telling everybody, including Netanyahu, that he is in direct contact with the long-sought Messiah. He is telling his followers, he's telling Israel, I am now in contact with the Messiah. And He says the Gog-Magog battle is very soon to come. Now, if he's in contact with the Messiah, he's talking face-to-face to to the Antichrist. Now, I was, um, when I pastored in Arroyo Grande, I I was a very, very good friend, very good friend, with a man named Abraham Rach. He was the rabbi of the Santa Maria um, Modern Orthodox Synagogue of the Jews. Reform is the most liberal, orthodox is conservative, modern orthodox is, is in between, middle of the road. He was kosher, very kosher. 
uh, et cetera. And he was a brilliant man. It's a long story how we became friends, but we became very fast friends. I was on the phone with him one day talking about, I had some questions and he was very gracious to answer them. And before we hung up, I said, you know, Rabbi, actually, I said, you and I have a lot more in common than what you might think. And he said, this really, he said, how is that? I said, well, we're, we're monotheist. Well, you know, the whole world says they're monotheistic. I, and he said, that's nice. I said, no, I said, we are strict monotheistic. Moses had it right. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Masoretic text, the Lord is one. And I would have given it to him in Hebrew, but I think he'd have laughed. <laughs> I know it, but it's not good. And uh, uh, he said, so are you telling me you don't believe in the Trinity? I said, that's exactly right. We do not believe in the Trinity. He said, well, you wouldn't have been very popular in Nicaea in 325 AD, would you? I said, oh, absolutely not. And I said, we were not popular in St. Louis, Missouri in 1916 in October when the Assemblies of God kicked us out because we didn't believe in the Trinity. He said, I want to meet you. He said, what are your Tuesday afternoons like? I said, well, they're, they can be flexible. I said, if I'm in town, I can, I can make stuff happen. I can arrange and rearrange outside of emergencies. He said, are you free this coming Tuesday? He said, I sit with a man. He's Jewish, but he is a Christian. And uh, we talk, we discuss everything. He said, I would love for you to sit in on that. So that began my four-year-long, every Tuesday afternoon, unless I was out of town, where we would spend from two to five hours a day, uh, every Tuesday, talking about everything you can imagine. Theologically, history, Israel, the United States, the Messiah, you name it. And I was born and raised in Pueblo, and he had lived in Pueblo for many, many years. In fact, when he left Santa Maria, it was to go back and take both the Reform and the Orthodox synagogues and be rabbi over both with agreement from both that within two years they would merge. I told him, I said, Rabbi Rach, they're not going to merge. Don't let them take. He said, no, no, they said they're going to merge. I said, they're not going to merge. And they never did. So be that as it may, we were good friends. And I asked him, I said, would you come and talk to our church on monotheism and let us have a Q&A, question and answer time? He said, I'd love to. So I didn't let him in the pulpit. I put a lectern right down in front. And I let him stand there. And I told the church ahead of time, I said, when, I, when we have this, he's going to talk to us about one God. And I said, when he's done, we're going to have a q and I said, the only thing I ask of you, you can ask him any question you want. Leave the Messiah questions to me. I said, you won't be disappointed, but leave them to me. So there was a host of questions. He brought his wife, Addie. Sometimes they'd come to our house and eat. It would be kosher food, obviously. And uh, they were kind. They really, really, really liked me. He was going to... Uh, write the introduction to my second book of David, but he died. And uh, I could tell you days when the Holy Ghost came into our meetings so strong. And I know one day he had to see. I know he did, but he shut her down. But anyway, so I was sitting over here and I said, okay, Rabbi, I have a question. I said, do you believe the Messiah has come? He said, no, I do not. I said, do you believe the Messiah is coming? He said, yes, I do. I said, when the Messiah comes, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a redeemer? Are you looking for God manifest in the flesh? Are you looking for someone to set free from bondage and open eyes and things of this nature? Are you looking for a political leader? What Messiah are you looking for? He never, he said, our Messiah will be a political leader. I thought, that's wide open for the Antichrist. 
So about two, three-ish years later, we had uh, Rabbi Haim Richman. You can look him up. Don't do it now. And uh, he's over the Temple Institute. Uh, he's also involved in raising money. In those days, he was very involved with raising money. He was traveling. And they were trying to procure the red heifer, which they now have. They were going to offer the first red heifer in August. They proclaimed it. But then it dropped from news. They, you can't find out anything else about it. But be that as it may, uh, I was called by a minister that was traveling with him. Would you like to have him? I said, okay. So we sat down a lectern in the front. Same deal. We're going to have a Q&A. I asked my friend, the rabbi, if he would please come. He said, no, I won't be there. The reason he didn't want to come, and I'm starting to get close to my point, he said, I'm not interested in them building a temple in Jerusalem. He's, and he told me this several times, him and Addie both. All they're asking for is a bloodbath. You try and build a temple in Jerusalem, and it's going to be a bloodbath. And it don't matter if you build it on the mount or you build it anywhere. It's going to be a deal. So he didn't, he didn't want to go. But Addie came. And Heim Richmond, just to tell you how conservative he was, he was in America eight months. He did not eat one single bite of food from America. He brought it with him or he had it continually shipped from Israel. He didn't trust American Jews in their kosher. He was that stringent. So he got up and he talked about the temple they were building. I talked to him before then. I said, so you have everything you need? He said, yes. I said, you have the brazen altar. We have it. You have the brazen laver. Absolutely. You have the candlesticks, the table of showbread. Yes, we have it. I said, do you have the Ark of the Covenant? Yes. I said, have you seen it? No. He said, but there are men that I would trust with my life that swear before God. They have it and they've seen it. Well, so he goes and talks. I asked him, do you believe the Messiah has come? No. Do you believe he's coming? Absolutely. What kind of Messiah are you looking for? I went through the whole deal. He said, our Messiah will be political. I thought they're ripe for the Antichrist. So Rabbi Rach's wife was there. She did not raise her hand. She stood up right about, she was sitting in the auditorium about like where you're sitting. And she stood up. She's a small little thing, but she was a lion. She didn't call him Rabbi Richmond. She said, okay, Mr. Richmond, you and your cohorts, that's exactly the way she put it, you and your cohorts there in Jerusalem, you are bent on building this temple. And you know that the day you put so much as a shovel in the earth to get started, you're going to start a war that will fill Jerusalem with blood from one end of the city to the next. I will never forget his answer. I asked my son Joel about it several months ago. I said, you remember that moment? He said, Dad, I will never forget that moment as long as I live. He stepped out from behind the lectern he walked towards the front row, and he said, Ma'am, if there's blood shed in Jerusalem, when we start building this temple, that's not my problem. Any blood that's shed is God's problem. That's not my problem. My problem is to build Ezekiel's temple. That's my problem only problem. And you could feel. 
I paid him $25 a year for him to send me three newsletters a year. I remember the last newsletter I got from him. I'm sorry, but it was so vitriolic. He was so mad at Yitzhak Rabin for giving land away in peace deals with Clinton that is, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, Heim Richman, it sounds like you're calling for Yitzhak Rabin's assassination. They shot Rabin within one month. And that's the last publication I ever got. But the guy that killed him was from the most orthodox sect of the Jews. So, I'm thinking, and I'm looking, and it starts dawning on me. Amen. How's that going to happen? If you remember when David wanted to build the temple, God said, no, you can't because you have shed so much blood. I'm going to have your son build it. Okay. Can I tell you something? When they start here, I'm getting to my point. When they start building that temple, and they're going to build it, rest assured, there's not going to be one drop of blood shed in Jerusalem. Not one. You know why? All of the blood was shed in the mountains of Israel. In chapter 38 and 39, you read of the war of Gog and Magog. Chapter 40 is temple. 41 is temple. 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, to the rest of the book of Revelation, I mean of Ezekiel, all it is is temple. You have 37, the nation, 38, 39, the war, and the rest of the book is the temple. This is why in 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 42, excuse me, let's do this really quickly. 40, Ezekiel, verse 2. The visions of God, he brought me to the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain, which was the fame, frame of a city on the south. Verse 3, he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood at the gate, and he starts measuring the lengths of the temple. 41 and 1, afterward he brought me to the temple and measured the post, six cubits broad on the one side, six cubits broad on the other side, which was the breadth of the tabernacle. 42, 1, then he brought me forth into the outer court, utter court, into the way towards the north, and he brought me to the chamber that was over against the separate place, which was before the building. 43, 1, afterward he brought me to the gate, even to the gate that looketh forward to the east. Can I just put it to you this way? After a victory of Gog and Magog, a battle like that, they'll build that temple anywhere they want to, thank you. And listen, Who's going to tell them no? What nation? They have beat Gog, Magog, Meshach. They've beat Persia. They beat Ethiopia. They beat Libya and other nations gathered. What Arab nation is going to tell them, you can't build? build. No, I guess you can if you want. That's the reason there's the Gog, Magog battle. We know there's going to be a temple for Antichrist to come into and break his covenant with them. They're going to accept him as Messiah. And then in the middle of it, he's going to break it. When you get to chapter 47, in fact, musicians. How long did I go? Um, Chapter 47, verse 1. This is temple, brothers and sisters. In fact, let's stand. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house to the south side of the altar. Notice verse 3. And when the man that had the lion in his hand went forth eastward, He measured a thousand cubits and he brought me through the waters 
and the waters were to the ankles and another thousand and another thousand and another thousand until they were waters to swim in. And they went to a sea and it says everywhere the waters went and he called us all in it to live. Do you know what the sea is? It's the Dead Sea. The waters that come out from the eastern gate flow in and heal the waters of the Dead Sea. And fishes are there. Why do I teach this? Why do I? I don't know that this, I think this is it. Why? One thing, how close are we? Look at the nations of the world. Look at Israel right now. Look at the Temple Institute where they're ready to go. Look at things that are happening in the world. Let me tell you, right now is the time for us to be reaching the lost. Right now is the time for us to be proclaiming. Hey, it's time to get ready. It's, it's time. It's time. It's time to get ready. It's time to stretch out our hand to the lost and die and say, Jesus is coming. When's the rapture going to take place? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. I know it's going to work. But I know we're close. Amen. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, there was a dispensation that was committed to Paul. It was the mystery of God where the Gentiles would be grafted in and brought in. It's not just Jews. It's out of every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. He's doing a work through this world. There's a nation and there's a church. And God is turning to Israel. And I'm closing. I have a friend of mine. And they, uh, they were on a tour Two and a half years ago in Israel. It wasn't the guide, but it was the bus driver. One of the uh, tour men that put it, put it together, he stayed on the bus and he got to talking to the bus driver. The bus driver said, he was watching them people go somewhere. And he, he said, I know these people. I know, I know these people. And uh, Man's a friend of mine, a preacher. He said, I don't know that you really know those people. I know those people. They, I, know, I know who they are. I know who they are. I, I know who they are. He said, you, you understand? These, these are holiness people. These people don't even watch TV. I know they don't watch TV. They don't watch TV. Their women don't cut their hair. They, they all dress holy, and they, they do the tongue thing. Go, ta, 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 ta. He said, well, these people baptize. I know they baptize in Jesus' name. I know who these people are. I got family in those people. And my friend said, what do you mean you have family in these people? Ah, I got family. Yep. They're in all that stuff. He said, where? Northern Israel. Outside of Haifa, up towards the border. He said, they baptize in Jesus' name. They do the tongue talking. Yeah, and they're holy. He said, how many of them are up there? Ah, about 150 of them. I'm going to tell you something. We have no idea what all God's do. We're all he's doing it. We're all he's working. Amen. But we are the people upon whom the ends of the ends of the world have come. And these things are all about us. And Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your heads. Your redemption draweth nigh. So while we're looking up, not upon all that stuff on the earth, we're looking up, we're also reaching. Brothers and sisters, oh, God loves this city. God loves this area. God loves this church. Hallelujah. He's given you new folks. He knows what he's doing. Let's go with the flow. Let's watch God move. Hallelujah. How many want to be used of God before he comes again? How many want God to hear your prayers and hear you teach Bible studies and 
let you contact people and see you bring people and watch them repent and be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and see them be established. If that's beating in your heart and you know the coming of the Lord is soon, maybe you'd just like to, to come and lift your hands and say, Jesus, I really want you to use me, God. Jesus, I really want to see your glory. Jesus, I know you're coming. I know you're coming soon, God. I want your majesty to be manifest. God, wake up my loved ones. Wake up sons and daughters and moms and dads and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and neighbors and friends and co-workers, God. Wake them up. Wake them up. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow. Become a servant of righteousness. Keep self pure. Be an example. Have faith in God. Follow Jesus. Put first things first. Resist temptation. Be faithful and be fruitful. <laughs>